Welcome to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's live streaming interview series, where leading new thought teachers, speakers, and authors share the intimate stories behind the 10 best spiritual books that inspired them the most on their spiritual journey. From well-known classics to hidden gems you might never have heard of, the No BS Spiritual Book Club saves you time and money by sharing reliable recommendations from those who've walked the path before you. The No BS Spiritual Book Club, the only No BS guide to the best spiritual books to inspire your own journey of self-discovery. Here's your host, founder of the No BS Spiritual Book Club, Sandy Sedgebeer. Hello and welcome with me today to share the stories behind the 10 best spiritual books that inspired her life journey is Catherine G. Lucas, a former university lecturer who left her academic career behind to step into her soul's deeper calling. Following a profound crisis of awakening, Catherine Lucas is founder of the UK Spiritual Network and author of four books on how to move successfully through crisis and harness the transformational power it holds. Catherine Lucas, welcome. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. Wonderful to be here. Good to have you here, Catherine. So um, tell us about the process of choosing just 10 from all the many books that have influenced your life journey. What was that like for you? Uh, Challenging. It's, um, I, kept, I kept coming up. I, I kept coming up with schemes to kind of sneak an extra title in here and there. <laughs> and um, in fact, I did. I did actually wonder. I thought if I number them one, two, three, four, five, six, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I, I thought maybe maybe she won't even notice that, <laughs> that, that actually there are eleven books, but I just kind of got the numbering. <laughs> so no, we always happy. notice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I thought you'd, you'd be on on the case, but it was no. It was fun. It was it was fabulous. It was um, yeah. I think I think what was particularly interesting was kind of for me it was kind of working out what order to present them in as well. It wasn't just choosing the books. It was like, well, yeah, what sequence are there? Do, do I want to kind of uh, explore them in? So yeah. Mm. So how did you do them? Yeah, well, well, actually, what, what what I started to realize was that, was that there were certain themes, you know, that there were kind of like they were kind of coming into, yeah, just just falling into certain themes. So I noticed that you know some of it was part of my healing journey, some of it was more, um, you know, in terms of my kind of uh, like awakening and and kind of you know books that related very much to spiritual emergence and emergency, and and then. Yeah, just 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 noticing these different kind of um, different types, different types. I think really, and 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 also kind of seeing that that actually what was really important to me wasn't so much the individual books, but was the the individuals behind the books, like the teachers, the mystics, the authors, and their body of work. I realised that actually with a lot of the people, a lot of the books that I chose, it was actually the body of work of that individual that mm. has really had a big impact on me. Yeah, so not not so much just one individual book, but everything about their their journey too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So let's look at the books. And the first one on your list um, is Other Lives, Other Selves, A Jungian Psychotherapist Discovers Past Lives by Roger Walger. And it's interesting how often past lives are coming up of late. I don't know whether people are getting a bit nostalgic for the past, want to escape the <laughs> present, but more and more people are putting forward um, past books on past lives that didn't really happen quite so much in the first year of the book club. Oh, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, Roger, I mean, he, he, he did such fabulous work over quite a number of years. I think he, he must have touched the lives of so many people. He worked internationally doing his, his um, regression work. You know, he, he worked in Europe, um, but particularly he did a lot of work in Brazil as well as in the States and, and the UK. Um, so, so yeah, and, and I think, you know, about his particular approach and 
uh, which I think com comes through in the book as well, it didn't involve using hypnosis. And I think a lot of people, a lot of uh, therapists who, who do past life work do mm. actually use hypnosis. And I, yeah, I actually like the fact that, that you know, when I, when, when I was in a group with him, it just seemed so easy to access this material. You know, we didn't need hypnosis to access the, 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 the material from, from the past. I, th I think, you know, his book, what, what happened was that um, I was actually on, on retreat and this was after my kind of full-blown kind of crisis in, in Egypt in, in 2003, which actually, you know, left me in a wheelchair temporarily. It was so kind of um, intense. And, and after that, I kind, of, I, I kind of took myself off on retreat. The longest retreat I've ever been on, actually, was two months. And just so that I could really just process the enormity of what I've been through. And while I was on retreat, kind of snippets of kind of like pictures and images started to come to me, like in my meditation or, you know, I think maybe even in like in the, in the daytime, you know, when I wasn't actually meditating. And I, I quickly realized, I quickly recognized that these were past life kind of snippets even though I had no experience, you know, I didn't have any kind of background in, in this at all. But then I kind of searched, I kind of looked for something that was going to help me understand what was going on. And I found Roger's book, um, which, you know, was was hugely helpful. And then when I got to one particular chapter, it just, you know, my body was kind of just responding so strongly that, that I, you know, I, I knew that something was was being activated and, and even triggered. And, and and I sought him out and went and, and did my first workshop with him soon after that. Um, and that and that was just the, the beginning of, of several years of, of working, um, you know, with him and and, mm. and and profound healing for me. This is one of the books, when I said that my books came into different categories, this was a, a huge, deep, deep part of my, my healing. Did you tell him what had happened to you in Egypt? And did you tell him what had happened to you after when you were getting all this bleed through, so to speak? Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I can't, you know, I mean, it's, it's a number of years ago now, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I did. And, and one of the things that I learned is that when these um, snippets start coming through initially, you tend to not get the really horrific stuff. Um, well, certainly that's what was happening for me. I was getting snippets and I was getting like hints, but the really kind of heavy duty, uh, horrific trauma that I needed to work through wasn't, didn't come up until I was in a very safe held space in, in a group uh, workshop with him. Uh, and then, I mean, it was it was uh, sexual violation, you know, like horrendous, horrendous stuff. Um, I was at one point um, I was uh, I had a, a life as a nun and and I was I mean, without going into too much of the graphic, horrible detail of it. But um, I was kind of raped by a soldier and 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 then the barrel of the gun was kind of shoved up inside me and and uh, and the trigger pulled i mean you know this is this is not easy stuff to heal and work through and he was you know roger was just incredibly compassionate and um and and yeah just phenomenal experience and insight into the process of how of how we can heal this stuff you know because what i learned was about the samskaras and how we have these patterns that repeat themselves lifetime after lifetime uh, because we, we're kind of looking for healing and they kind of repeat themselves uh, to different degrees and in different ways and, until we manage to kind of get the, you know, find the healing, create the healing that we need. So a samskara, to give you an example of a samskara, he, he talks about it in his book, um, explains it very well. Like, say, for example, somebody might have been hung in, a, in one lifetime, and then in this lifetime, they're born with the umbilical cord wrapped around their neck, for example. This is how mm. we kind of see the patterns repeating themselves. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. So ultimately, what did you take from that book? Uh, well, it was just the beginning. It was the beginning of a of a of a powerful journey of transformation and healing. 
Um, mm. And I think, you know, for anybody reading it, I think, you know, if anybody feels drawn to it, because I wouldn't necessarily recommend that people just dig around in past life material for the fun of it or the hell of it. You know, it's not much fun, actually. Um, you know, it's only really if stuff is coming up that I think it's worth kind of really, you know, say okay so this is calling for my attention this needs my attention and I think if you read that book of Rogers read it in such a way that you're kind of feeling into you know where is my body responding what is resonating mm -hmm. where is where yeah. is my piece of, of the healing uh, jigsaw puzzle mm -hmm. well book number two is spiritual emergency when personal transformation becomes a crisis which was um had many contributors, many really well-known, including R.D. Lang and Ram Dass and Jack Cornfield and Bruce Grayson, but it was edited by Stanislav Groff and Christina Groff. And that book was published in 1989. When did you come across it? Oh, that's a good question. I must have come across it in about 2001. Yeah, so it had been out. It had been out 20 years. And do you know there'd been virtually nothing published in that time uh, uh, on spiritual emergency. Yeah. yeah. So what, what attracted, was it the word spiritual emergency? Um, let me see if I can remember. <laughs> I remember it was like 20 years ago. Um, it, it was, it was certainly, it was on the reading list. I was doing a, a transpersonal uh, psychotherapy training. This was part of my healing journey. I had no intention of becoming a, a, a a transpersonal psychotherapist but I knew that I had some deep healing work to do so I was doing this training and it was on the reading list now I had been through I had been through profound crisis at the age of 20 when I'd ended up on a psychiatric ward for a month and but but I had never found any answers to what had happened to me at the age of 20. You know, I knew that it was, you know, this wasn't what I was being told. You know, I was being told that there was something wrong with me, that, I, you know, this was a, a mental health issue. And yeah, on some level it was because I did have, you know, I, I come from quite a wounded family. My father was an alcoholic. So, you know, you know I definitely had had mental health stuff to, to heal. But it was, I knew that what was happening had far greater significance but you know I came from a very secular family at the age of 20 I don't think I'd even heard the word spiritual Sandy you know it was kind of mm. and 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 so so when I came across this book which was talking about the relationship between mental health and, and and spiritual crisis it's kind of like mysticism and madness this kind of relationship it's like you know the penny started to drop, you know, it's a huge aha moment. And I know a lot of people, when they first come across that book, they, they just have like tears of relief, you know, of like, oh my goodness, this is what happened to me. Um, this mm -hmm. is what I was going through. And it's uh, interesting how psychiatry has always, um, you know, failed <laughs> to distinguish between, you know, a, a breakdown and a breakthrough. Um, but that seems to be changing now. And you started the Spiritual Crisis Network, didn't you, um, about the, 15, 16 years ago? In, in the UK, yeah. And actually, yeah. I was inspired by Christina Groff because in that book, the one you, you know we're talking about, um, you know, I, I learned that Christina had had created in the States a spiritual emergence network. And so I, I was just inspired. I, you know, after my crisis in 2003, when I ended up in the wheelchair in Egypt, um, you know, I, I realized that we desperately needed more information and more support for people going through this because there was so at the time, you know, this is going back 20 years now, Sandy, there was there was so little out there. And thankfully, mm -hmm. That, that has changed and, and, and psychiatry is now becoming more enlightened as well and and there have been a, a lot more books you know that have, have over the years uh, that have that have contributed to that process including your own including my first book yeah yeah mm -hmm. which again was inspired by this one that we're talking about yeah yeah let's just take a couple of minutes here because this is such an important subject and there are so many people who seem to be having some kind of breakthrough over the last few years. Um, you know, the world's been in crisis. It's continuing to be in crisis. And uh, I think we're at a point 
you know, history where we will look back and say there was a huge awakening taking in, taking place. Um, but it's very painful for some people. Describe, you know, what you would regard as a spiritual emergency. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Sandy. Um, you know, one way of of uh, describing it is that you know when we're on our spiritual path on our journeys, you know, for most of us, most of the time, we're kind of we're we're growing and healing and awakening gradually at a certain pace, and and what happens sometimes is that uh, things can suddenly speed up. So, so, you know, you can have like a, a sudden awakening, um, you know, a sudden crisis, like, like you, you know, often it's triggered by, by some kind of um, tra- maybe a physical accident, maybe a bereavement, you know, it can be triggered by all sorts. Um, you know, we've certainly, there's enough happening in the world right now with the, with the pandemic and the war and things for people, you, but, but I think, I, th- I think actually often it's uh, at a more personal level, some kind of trauma or crisis that's really impacting on us very locally. And I guess the pandemic has impacted on a lot of people very personally. Um, and so, so, so what happens when it, when it speeds up is that, is that it can become really unmanageable. So suddenly we're in, you know, where we find ourselves in this crisis situation where if there's a sudden kind of kundalini awakening and um, we've never come across kundalini before um then there's a lot happening in the body energetically and vibrations and electric currents <laughs> what feels like um so there can be a lot happening there and and and, and you know it, it, it people typically don't sleep for for days on end um you know there's a whole you know without going into too much detail there's, there's a there's a whole kind of uh, plethora of ways in which it manifests and emotionally it's an absolute roller coaster um because anything that needs healing anything that needs our attention just comes kind of exploding up to the like a volcano erupting it just all comes up at once and and it's very intense and very full on and and hence you know why in, in Egypt I ended up in the wheelchair my legs just mm-hmm. gave way with what I was going through, what internally there wasn't anything happening externally other than, I guess, the powerful energy in Egypt. Um, yeah. So before we leave that uh, subject, then tell us, tell us what is the most important thing somebody needs to know if this is happening to them? Uh, that actually the far more people go through this than we realize and, and with the right support and information come through it absolutely fine. Um, I think that's really important because we tend to feel so alone and isolated. It's, it's like we don't realize it's a phenomena and that there's a term for it, you know, it's called spiritual emergency. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think, and just the importance of reaching out for support, you know, the, it's, it's very, uh, very challenging time and there is support available there's so much more support available now um, than, than there was um, mm. so I think in a nutshell that's probably it yeah well thank you for sharing that because I think it is important if anybody is watching this who is experiencing that right now and does feel very alone let's move on to book three which is the most influential unpublished work in the history of psychology, many people believe, and that's the Red Book by Jung. And that was created over a period of about 15 years, wasn't it? Starting in 1915 and going through to 1930, but not published until 2009. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what, what an extraordinary book. Um, you know, it was, um, when it when it came out, I mean, the following year in 2010, I was working on my first book and I, I was researching my first book and I was so excited, you know, and I discovered that, you know, that it had been published and that it was available. And um, I mean, it's a huge tome. The front cover of it doesn't really give you a sense. I mean, this is a huge, heavy tome. I remember kind of lifting it off the shelf and kind of staggering with it. <laughs> <laughs> almost um I don't know maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit but I certainly remember you know it, it it's a significant tome and it's got these these beautiful I think part of why he spent so many years working because his actual his actual kind of crisis his spiritual emergency his kind of awakening I, I believe was over a period of three or four years but he worked on on the on on the red book uh, for a lot longer and I think part of that was 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 the beautiful 
kind of exquisite mandalas, um, which in themselves kind of, you know, can take you into an altered state. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're powerful. And, and his, you know, his journey, he, he credits that period of his spiritual awakening, you know, this kind of spiritual emergency, because there's no doubt that he was in crisis. He, he did manage to carry on um, working with his clients, his patients. But he says that he didn't read a book. He didn't read a scientific book for three or four years. It's like when we're in these kind of liminal places, the left brain just, just doesn't work. You know, we're, we're kind of, we're, we're very much in right brain mode. And, and he credits that period you know, with the, the whole of his life's work, the whole of his subsequent work, he 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 kind of puts down to the, that that period, and and I can relate to that, Sandy. You know, when I look at you know what happened to me in two thousand and three, and and um, in two thousand six, I had another period of crisis as well, and 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 the whole of of the rest of you know since then, like twenty years worth of work has come from that kind of one week in Egypt. Um, you know, so I can really understand what he's saying when he credits that period with his, his life's work. So how long did it take you to get through that tone? Uh, well, now here's the thing. I, I, now, how did that work? Because I, I went to access it in a library. I remember traveling to, to, to London to, to access it in, in the library. Um, and because I was doing, I was doing quite a bit of research in the British Library at the time. Um, I was reading Van Gogh's um, letters uh, to his brother, um, and and so now I, somehow or other, I had I seem to I had an electronic version of it on my computer because I seem to remember I. I was looking at it on my computer. You know, I, I can't remember, and I'm not sure that I even read it cover to cover. I mean, it's quite a tome, uh, Sandy. Um, but, but certainly I quoted from it, and, it, and it, that was what was so exciting and thrilling, actually, because I knew that I was one of the first people to be quoting from it in a book that was, you know, about to be published. Um, so that was fun, yeah. Is it accessible reading? Uh, I think yeah, because it. I, I think so because it comes across like a like a story almost, like this, this kind of this imaginal realm that he enters into and the characters, the people he meets, um, and and of course there's you know you can interpret it so much. Uh, you know, there's so much in there in terms of the symbolic significance is kind of very rich from that point of view. Um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, obviously, it's going to be people that are interested in transpersonal psychology who are, who are likely to want to read yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, book number four. Now, of course, that one was written by someone who everybody knows had his own period of crisis, um, The Power of Now, A Guide to Spiritual Enlightenment, Eckhart Tolle. And that was published in 1997. Yeah. So tell us Sorry. about your response to that book. Well, um, when I first when I first read it, I hadn't yet come across the term spiritual emergency. I hadn't yet come across Groff's work. So I was reading it very much from a kind of a mindfulness perspective. You know, I'd been meditating uh, for a few years. I, I was kind of, yeah, just coming at it from, the, from that angle. Uh, and so the fact that that he went through that he went through his own crisis and kind of ended up sitting on a park bench for two or three years processing it, I think kind of slightly passed me by at that point. Um, and then I think it was it was only you know once I kind of uh, kind of realised the significance of of like you know it's it's when it's this dark night of the soul you know this is one form of spiritual because there are there are, the spiritual emergency can manifest in different ways and, and one form is the dark night of the soul which was very much uh, Eckhart Tolle's um, experience you know he'd he'd had suicidal thoughts from from a teenager I believe so um so yeah so once I realized the significance I, I think I you know I kind of went back and kind of found out as much as I could about his his story, his journey, um, and, and became as interested in that, if not more so than the actual, you know, the, the book itself, which is, which, we, you know, was phenomenal. I mean, it, it had a huge impact on so many people. It was a real, 
uh, kind of game changer that book. And I'm sure I'm sure mm -hmm. a lot of your guests have it on their list. <laughs> Yeah, it certainly made it as one of my bookworms. Um, I yes, I had my own um, ahas reading that book. Mm. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, book number five is a lesser known book by one of the world's greatest meditation teachers, but one that has been really important to you, and it is the Blooming of a Lotus. Lotus, a guided meditation for achieving the miracle of mindfulness by Thich Nhat Hanh. Yeah, yeah. And of course, um, Thich Nhat Hanh Thai, you know, as he's known, which means teacher, um, passed over relatively recently. And, um, mm -hmm. and, and, and so, yeah, I mean, that book, I mean, he's, you know, he was a prolific writer. I mean, phenomenal. I've actually only dipped my toe into, uh, into his, into his, you know his all his various uh, offerings and so I've kind of got that to look forward to now <laughs> I've just got so many more of his books that I can kind of immerse myself in this particular one is um it's very much I had already I had previously read The Miracle of Mindfulness and um yeah kind of been touched by that by by the the beautiful simplicity of uh his approach to mindfulness really and uh, and so the the blooming of a lotus is is really it, it's a collection of guided meditations. Okay, so it's not a book. It's not kind of like a book that you would read from beginning to end. It, it's kind of it, it's different from the other books um, that I've chosen, really, from that in in that sense. And you know, Thich Nhat Hanh developed a, a very particular way of teaching meditation, of guiding people through meditation, which was kind of in these in these couplets almost. That's kind of how I think of it. You know, so breathing in, I'm aware, I'm aware I'm breathing in, for example. You know, breathing out, I'm aware I'm breathing out. Or breathing in, I follow the whole of the in breathing out I follow the whole of the out breath so so these couplets and and obviously it gets far more kind of profound because it, it kind of goes into the kind of like the real um depth and, and profundity of the Buddhist teachings um with these these various different meditations and um so yeah, so it, it's I, I think it's probably for people who teach meditation because I you know I'm, I kind of teach uh, mindfulness and, and meditation um, not not as much as I well I kind of incorporate it into my other programs now. Whereas for a number of years I, I taught you know I, I taught the kind of classic eight week mindfulness course. So I think it's a book that's probably of interest, particularly to people who teach mindfulness and, and meditation. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, you say that. Thai was a sacred activist extraordinaire. He really put engaged Buddhism on the activism map, and that brings you to your next choice, which helped you realize and own the fact that you too were a sacred activist. What does that mean? Yeah, well, maybe I'll say a little bit first about how I see Thai, you know, Thai's kind of sacred activism, because that kind of, I think that really puts it in perspective. I mean, you know, he was Vietnamese, and he was a very young monk during the Vietnamese War. And he just did this extraordinary work, um, you know, with with people uh, who were kind of, you know, like rebuilding um, houses and hospitals and, and taking children, you know, orphanages and just did extraordinary work. And then not only that, at the end of the Vietnamese War, you know, he went to America and worked with them. the American veterans have been so traumatized by their involvement in Vietnam. So, you know, he's, this is really, you know, he doesn't just kind of teach you know, he kind of really embodied, he really put into action the, the level of compassion and mindfulness. He, he, you know, he was teaching his fellow monks, his, the young monks, to, 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 to not um, hate the, you know, the, the, um, the Amer what the Americans were doing to the Vietnamese people. You know, it was just extraordinary. Um, reminds me of, of, of Victor Franco. Anyway, <laughs> I don't want to get sidetracked into yeah. other things. But yeah, so so sacred activism, you know, sacred activism is where we kind of really, we on the one hand, there's this activism. There's a, there's a, there's a motivation to create change in the world. Yeah, positive change. 
But of course, if we do that without a connection to our kind of our spiritual selves and and the, and the kind of uh, kind of source, the power, if you like, the of kind of of, of the divine then there's such a danger a that yes we do get in you know we get very stuck in anger and hatred you know and that's a, a big mm -hmm. danger but and, and maybe more so there's a danger of burnout you know how are we going to if we if we're relentlessly kind of working for change in the world a year in and year out decade in and decade out how do we do that uh, and, and nourish ourselves and nurture ourselves and not get burnt out and this is where being able to touch into the joy um, which our spiritual practice and our spiritual understanding gives us, you know, just this bliss and joy and, and understanding that we are so much more than, than our physical bodies and our, our personalities. Um, you know, that this, this is what feeds us in helping us make, make the change in the world. And um, so, yeah, so that's, and, and, and in terms of realizing that I had already been doing that to some extent is that, you know, I was motivated by wanting to, certainly with creating the Spiritual Crisis Network, writing my first book, you know, in case of spiritual emergency, I was very much motivated by wanting to create a shift in mainstream, you know, the paradigm of mainstream mental health. And, and I think, you know, a lot of us, uh, you know, together be motivated by this. And I think, you know, in the last 15, 20 years, we have uh, contributed to that shift starting to happen. So, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, book number six, which, um, it, you know, it is a contribution to that, is The Hope, A Guide to Sacred Activism by Andrew Harvey, which was also published in 2009. Yeah, and you know, Andrew Harvey is, is such a huge contribution, I think, to the field of sacred activism. You know, he kind of, I, I think, I don't, know, I don't know who coined the term, I almost feel like maybe it was Andrew who coined the term, um, and kind of, uh, you know, and, and maybe even slightly ahead of his time, you know, because it's only literally in the last two or three years that I've started seeing, like, like the, the British Psychological Society, their transpersonal section uh, last last autumn, last fall, their conference w was on um, uh, spiritual activism, transpersonal activism, sacred activism. You know, we're talking about the same thing. And so I, you know, I, I mean, and and there were one or two other things that I saw as well. Um, I think the Irvin Laszlo, um, the Laszlo Institute mm -hmm. did, did an event ar around it. So, so you know, it's kind of really starting to kind of enter the kind of consciousness a bit more and and you know all credit to Andrew for really you know helping that mm. um there are seven laws of sacred activism I understand that have the potential to change the world what are they <laughs> oh now you're asking um is that in the book is that in the hope it was a number it, of years ago it is it is in his book yes yeah. right well it was a number of years ago that i read that sunday so i'm afraid i can't i can't answer your question but what i can tell you is that when i read that book i was moved to, to tears on several occasions you know and and it wasn't just like soft gentle tears it was like sobbing you know, I think mm -hmm. Andrew has that ability to kind of really get to the to the heart of things and and to touch our hearts. Um, you know, I think he, his passion is, is is just you know it comes through, and and so yeah, I kind of um, I, I'm I, curious. I, yeah, what sort of things had you in tears? Was it stories that he related? Do you know, I went back, I was looking at it, I, 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 what, you know, in preparation for our conversation, I, I, I went back and had a look at where I'd made notes in the margin, because I, you know, I kind of write in, in these books, albeit in pencil, I'm, I'm, I'm really, yeah, I always write in pencil in my books. Um, and, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't really find, I couldn't really find the sections that had kind of really brought me to that place. I think, you know, I was on retreat at the time. It was December 2012. You know, the energy was, was powerful mm. in December 2012. So I think, you know, it was, it was a combination of that and, 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 and just, yeah, just, um, you know, he writes beautifully as well. Um, so, so it touches mm. you on so many different levels. Well, his book is badly needed in this senseless time of violence and hatred, isn't it? Yeah, 
yeah it is it mm. is and um yeah. and you know and he's still working you know he's still um very much um you know working at, at that you know at that at, at that forefront if you like of of the sacred activism and you know and i i think my own understanding you know i i learned so much from that book about how to nourish and feed myself in my activism and mm. and how you know we absolutely need our spiritual practice and the prayer and and our devotion and, and you know our chanting you know whatever we absolutely need that um to to kind of nourish us and and, and fuel us um, and for, mm. for me, something that is is very powerful for me is is kirtan, which is this kind of sacred uh, chanting, um, kind of call and response. I, I find that is one of the things that that really feeds me deeply, um, in in terms of yeah, I mean other things as well. But that's well, that's one of my main. Mm. Well, the um, reading about the book, there was a passage that says that you can learn how to incorporate a spiritual practice into your life, transform anger into positive energy and take part in a global community. Reclaim a world that for too long has been driven by selfishness and hatred. Discover the infinite joy of giving. Turn away from everything you've been and done and believed and dive into the consciousness of a divine love that embraces all beings. While the future may appear bleak, the hope provides practical advice to all those who want positive change. That is such an important statement about a book, and it is probably the number one thing, as I said, that we need today. Um, mm. Mm. Yeah. And the, the overlap for me is also with, um, you know, with, with like Ty's work, Thich Nhat Hanh's work, that is so much about transforming that anger and hatred. Yeah. And, and, you know, he, uh, um, you know, and even, even just this last weekend, actually, there was an online retreat because they were scattering uh, Ty's ashes. And, you know, you know, the, the kind of the monastics were sharing about how, you know, we, we absolutely, you know, in terms of the situation in the Ukraine, for example, you know, we have to transform our own um, violence, our own anger and, and, and hatred. We can't, we can't possibly make a contribution to peace if we ourselves internally are not at peace. And, and that was really, really powerful, you know, a, just a really good reminder for me, because if we're meditating on peace for the Ukraine and sending out our energy to the Ukraine, which, by the way, is, is very powerful, you know, we have scientific proof that this works, um, then we have to be coming from a place of our own inner peace. Uh, otherwise, yeah. that the energetic vibration of what we're trying to do just isn't going to, it's just not going to happen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, book number seven, uh, apparently, um, after Don Quixote, is Spain's most widely read prose classic. And it is one of the greatest stories of religious life ever told, I believe. The Life of St. Teresa of Avila. And it's written by herself. Yeah. A long time ago. Yeah, yeah. A very long time ago. <laughs> a very ago. long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's remarkably readable, uh, Sandy, given that it was written in the 16th century. It's um yeah. remarkably readable. And I don't know, you know, I didn't I didn't read it in Spanish, I'm afraid. I read it, I read it the translation. So maybe it's, it's also credit to the translator there. But um extraordinary, extraordinary um uh, journey, you know, of um and actually I do want to to show um because I have here a, a different front cover. I have the, the edition that I have, um, which is the Penguin Classic, and I don't know if you can see that. And there mm. she is, you know, that's a sculpture by Bernini, and that's her in one of her kind of ecstatic raptures. Um, but, but you know, for many years before they kind of transformed into ecstatic raptures, it was like she had this kind of mysterious illness. Um, that left her kind of paralyzed and immobile and like semi-conscious for you know a lot of the time um, and then kind of like fainting spells I mean it was it was a pretty full-on um, full-on journey for her um, and and yeah and the longest the longest uh, that I've come across the the longest personal experience of spiritual emergence and emergency you know it, it it went on and on and on for years and years and years until uh, at one point she had a particular kind of uh, spiritual um, kind of uh, breakthrough or experience 
and and then it and then things started to shift for her and and i think her health issues started to become a little bit easier and 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 the states that she would fall into became more these kind of ecstatic raptures so yeah it's, it's an extraordinary story and book because it, she tells it in her own words mm, yeah and uh having had your own experience of you know temporary paralysis it must have um, really hit home for you too yeah, and you know, thank goodness, thank goodness, because I, I think what happened was that that I was somehow there was uh, some kind of energetic transmission happening while I was because what I did when I was researching my book, my first book, Sandy, I was working with like primary sources as much as I possibly could, and I wasn't just reading them; I was kind of really kind of engaging with them, which is why I also worked with her her, her book, Interior interior castle which is which is a kind of spiritual journey you know a, a kind of to to awakening and kind of getting more and more in touch with our our, our soul um and um so yeah so i was really working with the energy of 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 of, of these books and what she was transmitting down through these centuries. I mean, it's extraordinary, really, you know, several centuries later, it's like this transmission uh, of, of energy. Mm -hmm. And so when I, when I had this experience of, of not being able to move, you know, lying on my bed and just not being able to lift my head off the pillow or move my arms or legs or torso, you know, I, I, it, it, it would have been terrifying if I hadn't read about her experiences. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, it was it was pretty weird. I mean, it was pretty, it was pretty far out, uh, really. Um, but at least I wasn't completely terrified, um, and and it passed. You know, where she had years and years and years uh, of it to contend with. But it it helped me to understand what she had experienced. You know, because I I got an experiential sense of like, wow, you know, this is yeah. what it was like for her. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So. Book number eight, The Life and Legacy of a Buddhist Master, Dipa Ma. Ma. Um, and tell me about Dipa Ma. So Dipa Ma, um, Dipa means light. And uh, I mean, she was, I, I, I find her so inspiring. I mean, you know, obviously I find a, a lot of these people, but I'm particularly, I guess, as a woman, I look for kind of inspiring women, especially on the awakening journey, you know, because I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by, by awakening and, and, and what is involved and how do we integrate it and how do we take it even further. And so Dipa Ma, you know, she was a lay person. She wasn't a monastic, you know, she wasn't mm. um, uh, like, Saint Teresa and and actually her awakening I, I think didn't happen until she was kind of like I think late 40s early 50s you know it was relatively late in life she was very much a, a householder she was a, 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 a wife a mother a grandmother and uh, and actually what what happened for her you know I, I think what happened for her was it was actually her grief which which was contributed to her, her awakening you know I was saying how this kind of uh, our awakening can be triggered by you know by all sorts of things she for, for many years so she was she was married very young um you know i think at the age of 14 to somebody that she barely knew you know as culturally that you know that was kind of um what happened for her and uh and then for many many years she couldn't conceive and then when she did her first child died um after 3 months um, and so, you know, she was kind of grief stricken and then, and then she had another child who, who did survive another girl. So these, the first two were girls. And then she had a third child it was a boy. And, and, uh, I, th the, the, I think the, the boy died in child at childbirth in, uh, you know, at the time of childbirth. And, and so, you know, she had this huge grief and then her husband died. And so she was left, I, I think something like, you know, at the age of, uh, I don't know, something like 47, 49, something like that. She was a widow with a, a seven year old, uh, cause she'd had in the end, she'd ended up having her children relatively late, um, with a seven year old to, to, to bring up. And, and she had, she had wanted to learn meditation. She had been felt called to the, the spiritual path for a long time. 
and and I think it wasn't kind of accepted it wasn't the done thing I think um but then finally at this point she kind of dedicated herself wholeheartedly and she was so committed I mean she was just she was just going for it I mean she absolutely was and her awakening happened in a, in a relatively short space of time and she had phenomenal teachers as, as well yeah mm. so it was more her her story her journey her experiences that uh, impressed you and inspired you? Well, I, I mean, it's partly that, but it's also such a gorgeous book. I mean, it's just it's just such a, a heartwarming book because it's, it's like all these little snippets of stories from her life shared by um, people like um, Jack Cornfield, Sharon Salzberg, um, uh, jo- Joseph Goldstein, you know, it's kind of she. She was their teacher. They they used to kind of go over to India and you know have um, you know sit with her and and have Dharma talks uh, with her, and um, and so there's just all these lovely little stories about about her. Uh, it's it's a, it's actually a relatively short book, a rel- relatively simple book, um, but it's yeah, it's just it's full of love. It, it really is full of love. Mm. Okay, so book nine is a book, another book that we need today because it lays out the blueprint for mastering the 10 steps that will take us through the stages of the global transition to our emergence as the universal human. And it is called Emergence, the shift from ego to essence by the late visionary and futurist Barbara Marks Hubbard, published in 2001. Yeah, what an amazing woman Barbara was. I mean, again, you know, this is, you know, I, I like I say, I looked to the, these women for my inspiration and, and, and I met her. I met her the same year that I met you, Sandy, you know, in, in 2012 uh, at the uh, the Conscious Life Expo. And um, yeah, and in fact, she, she inspired me. You know, I remember because I went to a talk that she gave at the Conscious Life Expo. I, w- I was kind of promoting, you know, my book and, and I went to hear her and, and she really inspired me. She, 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 she told her story. She shared her story. And, and it was, you know, I was captivated by it and because I think, you know, I'd been kind of giving talks and doing public speaking, but I, I hadn't realized the power of sharing our story quite to the same extent. And when I heard her sharing her story, you know, how she'd been this, this housewife um, and, and, and then, and then at one point she, I think she, she ran for like vice president of the, of America at one point. I mean, you know, just an extraordinary story. Um, and then, and, you know, and, and her own spiritual journey. But it, but it really encouraged me to start sharing my story and telling my story. Um, so, mm-hmm. so I'm very grateful to her for that. And um, just a, a beautiful soul and, and a huge contribution that she made to, you know, like I think even just this term conscious evolution, um, you know, yeah. we, we now, you know, that's kind of really entered into our, our kind of parlance. Um, thank, thanks to her. And, and, and I, what I what some of the key ideas that I took um, from Barbara's work uh, was, was around, you know, crisis being the driver of evolution. And, and, you know, and, and I'd, I'd already made the connection between our personal awakening through crisis and then our global awakening through crisis. It was like staring me in the face, really. Um, but she kind of really put it into words and, and kind of just helped me to have the confidence to, to say, yeah, this is, you know, this is, this is how it works. This is, is what's happening. And, um, and, and so Barbara's, you know, Barbara's an example, I think, of where, it's the body of her work um, that really I- impacted me. Not just this one, not just this one book, really. Mm. Uh, um, but although that that yeah. this this particular book, I, I took on retreat with me, and I worked again. I really kind of really worked with it, and and it was powerful for me when I, I worked through uh, what she re- the process that she recommends for for stepping ever more into our divine self, our universal uh, human. Mm. So your final book, you say, is one of the first spiritual books that you ever bought. It was published in 1978 and it sold over 7 million copies. And it's a much loved book. It's creative relation. Use the power of your imagination to create what you want in your life by Shakti Gawain, published in 1978. Probably one of the first people. Well, there were a few before, but... uh, 
um, certainly one of the biggest contributors to the idea that we can, we do have the power to create what we want. And visualization is, a, you know, an important key along with intention. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, it was reading Shakti's book where I kind of, because I'd already been working um, with, you know, conscious intention. I'd, I'd come across some research, you, you know, back in the days before I'd kind of come across spirituality, <laughs> I'd come across some research, some uh, MBA students that if you write your goals down, you're much more likely to actually uh, achieve them. So I'd already been working with like, you know, setting clear conscious intentions and writing them down. And then when I came across Shakti's work, it's like wow it just made so much sense you know it's it's all about energy it's it's all about you know um kind of uh, calling in uh the you know at a vibrational frequency level and um mm -hmm. and i know you know since her work there's been a lot of other people who've, who've done work uh, on this since but i i haven't really bothered with them because i just haven't really felt the need so much it's kind of like you know her, her her book just 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 did it all for me and and actually i think you know some of the some of the fabulous things that that I've co-created with Source, and I certainly don't take the credit for some of the, you know, things. But but I I kind of I think a, a lot of it has been thanks to working with her her kind of uh, approach and, and methodology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On your page on the website, um, that for many years you thought of yourself as helping people to cope with and move through spiritual emergency to upgrade their lives in line with the shifting consciousness they've been through. And that what you now realize is that what you're really interested in for yourself, for your students and your clients is awakening. Say a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things that happens when we go through a spiritual crisis or spiritual emergency is that we are so transformed by the process. You know, it's like it's like it's like a rebirth. You know, we're we're a new person, and we get to recreate our life. We get to recreate our life um, from from the new level of consciousness that we've shifted into. So so we get to kind of upgrade our life in in effect. And and I certainly felt that that's what happened for me. And and so I, I take a huge amount of delight in helping other people when they've been through spiritual crisis to do that, you know, to, to kind of see, OK, so what does this mean for my life? Um, how do I really fully step into um, the yeah just the the kind of my soul's deepest calling uh mm -hmm. but then in terms of the awakening i mean that's you know that's the spiritual emergency and and then the i think i think sandy what has happened for me and it's it, it's just happened really just since since the beginning of this year but i guess it was percolating is that i have kind of reconnected and recommitted to my own kind of I mean, it's not that I ever lost it, really, but uh, but like recommitted to my own awakening. It's like, you know, sometimes I think we can get busy in the world and, and you know, we're being of service. We're doing whatever we're doing. And and actually, my deepest longing is to take my own awakening as far as I possibly can. And 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 so I've just kind of started kind of reconnecting with that and, and remembering it's almost like, you know, in 2003, I had that aspiration. And then, you know, that's like nearly 20 years ago, somewhere along the line, it got it got a little bit watered down, a little bit kind of lost in the in just in in life well it was partly actually in terms of my healing journey and finding my wonderful husband and things like that you know these are things that are important don't get me wrong but but now I'm ready maybe I'm at dipper bars kind of stage in life where now I'm kind of really ready to kind of re-engage with that and to help and to help my you know my my clients my students uh, do that as well because this is what's happening we, we have such a fabulous opportunity right now the energy collectively is so conducive to us waking up individually and collectively and so it, it's a perfect time for me to focus on my own kind of uh, deepening uh, of, of that and to be supporting others to do it as well um, you know we we can we, we we it's kind of given to us you know we can take it as far as we want now we really can yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you published so your first book. Yeah, sorry. Carry on. No, continue. I, 
I was just going to say, I've, I've kind of come up with this, this phrase because I was thinking, you know, what is it about the awakening? Um, you know, we, I've, I've just, for so many years, I've used the term spiritual emergency. And I thought, well, the, where's the people, you know, what's the, what's the, and it came to me recently that it's about accelerated awakening. Okay, this is when things get tricky and when we get into crisis, this is when our awakening accelerates and speeds up too much. And that's what's now happening globally is, you know, we're going through collectively accelerated awakening. And so I, I can see this is going to be my new kind of catchphrase. I think, you know, this kind of accelerated awakening and, and, and let's see who else starts using it. Because I think we all influence each other, you know, in, kind of, in terms of memes and language and, and things. Yeah, yeah. Um, 2012, you published your book, 2011, you, you published your yeah. book, 11 years ago, yeah. yeah, in case of spiritual emergency, which has become known as a seminal text. Um, when you wrote that book, did you ever think ahead 11 years to what you might be doing? No. I'm curious to know if, <laughs> if you know... What has happened in that period for you um, beyond what you hoped might happen? Well, I mean, it's, it's just extraordinary, Sandy. I mean, it's completely life changing. And I was tempted to put my book on the list, you know, in terms of books that have changed my life. I thought, well, actually, of all the books, <laughs> that probably my first book has changed my life more than any other book. You should have done. <laughs> but, well, no, I didn't, I, I didn't done. want to be too um mm. too self indulgent but 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 here's the thing i mean it really has changed my life because it's help it, it's enabled me to help the people i wanted to help okay the people out there going through this that had no idea what's happening they don't have the language for it they don't understand it they they feel alone and isolated they're terrified they're told by by psychiatry that they you know they're given these horrendous labels and medication and that and that's going to be the their life for the rest of their lives and and you know and and the feedback you know i still get lovely comments to this day well because you know it, it's still selling it's still in in print and and, and yes. selling and, yeah. and 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 people are reading mm. it and, and and actually i wouldn't be at all surprised you know, this year and, and next year, you know, I, I, even more people probably are going to be, be needing to read it and come across it. You know, what's so difficult for people is they don't even know what to Google. When they go through these experiences, they don't even know what to put into the search engine to get the help yeah. that they need. Um, so, yeah, so, so I mean, it's, it, it has, it, on the one hand, it's enabled me to, to help people. It's, it's given me the opportunity to speak internationally, to, to help uh, kind of get this information out more widely, that there's this phenomenon, uh, you know, and that it's well researched and documented. And, 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 you know, there's a whole body of research and science behind it. This isn't some kind of woo woo new age stuff. We have uh, the field of transpersonal psychology, uh, you know, spiritual psychology and the work of people like Stan Groff and Christina Groff um, and, and so yeah it, it's just um, and and then you know and, th and then actually what <laughs> happened was that a publisher then approached me a commissioning editor of a of, of a of a mainstream big publisher uh, they're, they're now part of Hodder and Stoughton approached me wanting something on mental health with the spiritual dimension and so I, I got to to write other books um getting the message out you know even more to a more mainstream audience and readership which was you know really what I was interested in and and essentially the same message but kind of packaged slightly differently I, I guess um yeah 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 so you recently initiated the publication of the open letter, The Rebirth of People and Planet in a Time of Global Emergency, along with an accompanying petition to the UN. What has been the response to that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure how widely it's got out there. Actually, um, I think I think actually the, the 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 summit that we subsequently did, the online series that we did, I think has reached more people in in a sense. Um, but but yeah, I mean, this idea I and mean, basically this this sense that you know we're going through uh, a death and a rebirth. We're going through a very painful awakening. Uh, you know, COVID is is just the tip of the iceberg. We've got the you know the the far more 
serious threat of the em environmental uh, emergency. And what we were doing with that letter was kind of really wanting to people to acknowledge and, and understand and see that we are in a global state of emergency, you know, and, and, but, but not to create fear because those of us that have been through spiritual emergency, we, we tend to not get fearful about these things because we've just kind of somehow integrated the trust and faith in the process. And so we've yeah. done that for ourselves individually. And then what that means is that collectively we can, we can have that as well, which doesn't mean that there aren't times when, when we are filled with with despair and grief and all the rest of it but but ultimately we have the hope you know this this title of andrew's book hope um so so i think yeah it's kind of um it, it was for me it was an important process because it, it that that letter that open letter and the petition then because I, I'm kind, you know, I was kind of feeling into what wants to emerge. You know, we there's, there's this phrase leading from the emerging future, and Barbara Marx Hubbard talks about this as well. You know, we kind of what is it that wants to emerge from each of us individually and collectively? And and so first it was the letter that wanted to I emerge, um, and and then from there it was this series online series of dialogues where we wanted to kind of bring people together in conversation to talk about this global emergency and and the different aspects of it very much from you know a sense of uh, awakening and and kind of like the the spiritual um understanding of the emergency mm. you founded co-creating our future which uh delivers group programs um tell us a little bit about that what kind of programs are you delivering yeah, so that's that. That's been, you know, this it's 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 been a, an extraordinary two or three years, really, Sandy. I moved to Spain in kind of like 2018, and and I've really been through my own kind of rebirth in the process um, because I've kind of reengaged with teaching where I had been teaching mindfulness. I've kind of started uh, teaching these these programs, basically helping people to 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 co-create their reality. You know, how do we co-create with source? And I draw on the work of people like Shakti Gawain um, mm. and, and quite a few others as well. Um, and so really helping people, like, like we absolutely can birth a new earth. This was the title of, of the summit, Birth a New Earth. Do it both for ourselves in our own lives and we can do it, you know, uh, in our organizations and groups and, and kind of collectively. So it's really kind of um, helping people to, to do that and um, teaching them the process because it's a process I take I take groups through the process of how we do this and 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 and, it, and, it, and I just love it you know because because the the synchronicity the miracles that happen you know for people when when they kind of start operating in this way of kind of just expected opportunities when we really start working with the energy at a vibrational level because it's all energy um and then opportunities start yeah. to appear out of the blues supposedly but of course it's not really <laughs> um so so yeah and and, and we delivered the 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 birth of new earth series uh through co-creating our future as well and um and me yeah maybe i'll just mention that if, if people want to kind of ha have a little taste of of um, you know, what, what we do and, and what we offered with the Birth of New Earth, there's a, a fabulous conversation between uh, Andrew Harvey and Caroline uh, Mace and myself and uh, my colleague, uh, you know, I think it was, it was Paul Levy. I was trying to remember which, because we kind of swapped around my different colleagues um, yeah. came yeah. in on different yeah. conversations. Mm -hmm. I think it was Paul Levy and the ball um, because we've now got the, the ever, if anybody wants to go and, and watch that series, I mean, it was a phenomenal series of, of conversations that we had and it was very well received. And, and so that, that the dark night of the globe, that's a conversation with, uh, with Caroline Mace and Andrew Harvey and Paul Levy. Uh, and that's available just for a kind of free, uh, uh, free download um, from co-creating our future. Uh, Are you going to um, do more summits? Well, here's the thing, and we're kind of regrouping a little bit. It was a huge amount of work. I mean, it was fabulous. And, mm. and at the same time, you know, it's kind of, I think for me right now, I'm just sensing into what wants to emerge, 
you know, what, what is it that wants to emerge next? I think there will be other summits, but not immediately. It, it's kind of like uh, there's, there's something else that wants to emerge. Um, so I'm um, yeah I'm just kind of feeling into that and and you know offering group programs you know that's kind of ongoing and my one to one work as well so there's plenty well, something to keep that us did all recently busy. something that did recently emerge was a new book uh well the the which are you talking about the life crisis one sandy the latest one yes yeah the life crisis a mindful way now when was now let me see i think that was 2018 yeah, that that actually, do you know? I think that that was launched. That was launched. That, that I was in Spain because I remember. I remember having conversations with the PR people. That that came out just as my husband and I were signing uh, for our new home here in Spain. So it was it was extraordinary, um, kind of uh, synchronicity. Like like just the timing was, was lovely. And of course, that uh, life it's called life crisis: the mindful way. Because I got commissioned, um, I got commissioned to do two books in the Sheldon Press uh, Mindful Way series, and 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 that was a it was a lovely opportunity. And of course, life crisis. You know, who doesn't need a book um, right now <laughs> that's going to help with coping with what's going on? And and it's just you know, it's it's mm. mindfulness. It's 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 just various mindfulness practices. It's a very hands on practical book. You know, my my books tend to be very kind of you know. Uh, practical really um yeah yeah okay well final question what are you reading now that's exciting you what am I reading now that's exciting me oh that's a that's a good question that's a very good question (laughs) um Well, I'm reading. I tend to have I tend to have different books on the go. Uh, uh, I yeah. tend to have different mm. books. I, I'm I'm trying to. I'm, I, I've just recently finished one, which definitely really I- I excited me. Which and and I think this will. I think you'll get this, Sandy, um, because I'm trying to remember the title of it. Oh my goodness! It was about a dolphin. It was about this woman who did work with dolphins and kind of communicating with dolphins. And um, it was kind of slightly fictionalized, but it was very much based on her work of communicating with these dolphins. And it really reminded me of the work of Susie Miller, you know, the work, the fabulous work that she does with the autistic communicating, like yeah. without communicating, like communicating at the soul level um, with the autistic mm-hmm. children. Yeah. And, yeah. and and I got I got very, very excited by that. And I, and I also kind of, you know, I, I had some guidance um, in the in the last year or two that you know that it would be good to go and swim with some dolphins and i'm just wondering how to do that in an ethical way um i think they've but, stopped um, it now in hawaii they've yeah, stopped I it i would be surprised yeah. 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 yeah 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 um you know which is a bit silly because you know i know people who run groups and and take people out to swim with the dolphins and uh in a very respectful and mindful way yeah. Yeah. um and i think that the law says you, you know you you can't you can't approach the dolphins. You can't, you know. But mm. what happens if a dolphin approaches you? you yeah, know? yeah. What's I, going I, to happen I, there? My, my sense is that is is that connecting with the they are they are very highly spiritually developed creatures, mm-hmm. and and I think connecting with them can really be really very beneficial for, on a healing level and an awakening mm. level. So, I mean, I hope I do get a chance to to do it at some point, but we'll see. Was the book by any chance written by Joan Ocean? No, I don't think it was. Does the name sound familiar? No. No. Well, Joan is the person I think that's done most of the work for many, many years. Um, right, Swimming right. with the dolphins, communicating with the dolphins. And her story is quite, um, you know, quite an amazing um, story. Um, I read that uh, some few years back, um, John Stuart Reed, who's done so much work with um, cymatics and sound, um, worked with some people. They did a scientific study and they were able to prove that um, dolphins communicate 
by transmitting holographic images, mm. which I thought was really quite fascinating. Mm. And of course, they obviously communicate with themselves with sound. But I often wondered how was Joan Ocean able to receive, you know, when she said that she, you know, she didn't go out to communicate with the dolphins. It happened, you know, spontaneously to her. And she started receiving all this imagery and these um, misinformation. And of course, you know, subsequently, this press release goes out to say, yes, transmit mm -hmm. holographic mm -hmm. images. Mm -hmm. How cool is that? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it is it's extraordinary, isn't it? And I think we're all moving. I think we're all moving in this direction, Sandy. You know that we're our abilities are are opening up. You know, in terms of telepathy, in terms of um, in terms of being more open to guidance, our kind of psychic abilities. Yeah. You know, this is the universal human that that Barbara yeah. Marx Hubbard talks about, and and, and yeah. you know it's happening. I and mean, and I think we're seeing it already. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's what Susie Miller has been saying for the last 20 years that the <laughs> collective consciousness of the children have been saying is that we are becoming the new human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's exciting times to be alive as well as challenging. It's ch Yes, and, you know, you, you can't have great transformation without, um, you know, a lot of challenges along the way. No, and I know that. I know that, and yeah. and and I have a sense that what we've had so far is is probably just the tip of the iceberg. You know, things could get far more challenging before they really start to turn around. And so, you know, it, it's like those of us that those of us that get it really need to kind of, you know, yeah, just kind of be there, kind of helping to hold this this huge process that we're going through. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, yeah. I, I still I have huge faith and trust and, and hope in the process. It's like I, I don't have any doubt that we'll make it. Um, and, and, you know, it's it's going to demand a huge, huge amount from all of us. Mm, indeed. Well, Catherine, it's been a delight to speak with you. And thank you for sharing your 10 best spiritual books with the No BS Spiritual Book Club. It's, it's, been, it's been absolutely delightful, Sandy. It's so lovely to reconnect with you. And it's almost exactly 10 years um, since, since we did the, the Las Vegas show, the, the, yes. the light yeah. broadcast. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Fabulous. Well, the world moves in mysterious ways, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. And so does life. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you, Catherine. Um, and uh, yes, let's talk again. Be interesting to catch up and find out what else is going on. Thank you so much for inviting me, Sandy. I really You're appreciate welcome. it. You're welcome. So if you want to know more about Catherine Lucas's work, books, and her online group programs, excuse me, we have two websites you can visit. One is Catherine G. Lucas, and that is Catherine-G-Lucas.com. And the other one is co-creatingourfuture.world. So check them out. And now, as the spiritual book market becomes increasingly crowded, it is becoming more challenging to sort the wheat from the chaff, which is why we launched the new BS Spiritual Book Club. So if you're looking for recommendations from authors, teachers, speakers, and others that have walked this path before you, check out our free 10 Best Spiritual Books archive at the nobsspiritualbookclub.com where in addition to viewing previous episodes in this series, you can add your name to our Save My Space list to get last minute reminders of upcoming video episodes. And if you have a book in you, but you don't know how to start getting it out of your head and into your hands, then visit sedgebeer.com, click on the Work With Me tab and find out how my experience helping others tell their stories might be just what you're looking for. That brings us to the end of this week's show. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and I'll be back at the same time next week with another 10 Best Spiritual Books interview. Till then, it's goodbye from me, and it's goodbye from Catherine Lucas. Bye for now.